During the 1860s, Indianapolis transformed, growing rapidly as a railroad city and as the gateway to the American West. The expansion attracted many new entrepreneurs, including German immigrant Christopher Schnabel, who established a bookbinding shop in 1873. Today, it's the oldest manufacturing company in the city. It was initially a small, family-run bookbinding shop, and turn the 20th century, and public libraries uh, begin to um, play a more important role in American society. And in that first generation transition, Oscar Schnabel, the son, becomes involved in a new process called library binding. In a library, a book might be handled by a hundred readers. And so library binding was developed to provide a stronger binding, to provide a more durable binding, something which could be read over a long period of time. And so about 1920, Oscar Schnabel entered into a partnership with several other binderies in the United States to begin to produce library binding. And through most of the 1920s, 1930s, National Library Bindery as a national company grew to be one of the largest book binderies in the United States. At its peak, the company handled binding for libraries across the country, including nearly every single book in the Indiana library system today. The company remained in the family for nearly 100 years until Ralph Schnabel, the grandson, decided to sell. It was advertised in the newspaper and so I got with Ralph and he kind of took me to, through the shop and I think, you know, I was only about halfway through it and I thought, this is just me. It was fascinating that it was still here and still operating. I wanted to be a part of that. In 1987, Joe bought the bindery with an eye towards the future. With the dawn of the information age, libraries were changing how they approached their collections. So Joe turned the bindery's focus to specialty binding, for small book runs to sentimental gifts, all the while continuing production on the century-old machinery. The artisanship attracted me. Rather than just the manufacturing, I, I have my share of daily duties with running a business, but I can always go out there and pick up some hand tools and create something, and, and that's a beautiful thing. I'd have to repair a book, so I'd have to get in and take that book apart. Looking to see how that book was, was put together was a great teacher to me because I saw things and, and said, well, you know, and figured out their function and methods of putting pages together and different things, different types of sewing. And, and I'd study it and learn from it. Each step had to be done to a certain amount of perfection to make the whole book come together well. And so learning that, that was something that really gave me an appreciation for how books work and the art of bookbinding. The company not only focuses on the art of bookbinding, but on the books themselves, offering restoration services for worn or damaged volumes. Everything from family heirlooms to the preservation of historical artifacts worth hundreds of dollars. That focus is what initially attracted Eric to the business. As an IUPUI professor and expert in rare books, Eric discovered the bindery after bringing his own 17th century books to be restored. Um, we've kind of talked about 45 to 50 different stages which go into creating a book. But when you take a book apart, we're looking at how much do you need to take it apart? How much do you need to put it back together again? What is the minimal amount of intervention? But also when we look at the end, how is it going to function? I can tell by looking at a binding kind of what that history of the book is. That the style of the binding or the quality of the binding tells you a lot about the market it was designed for or who the person who owned that book was at a certain period. The fact that a book is heavily worn tells you that this book was important to somebody at some stage in the past. If a book has never been used, that also tells you a lot about the role that book has played in somebody's life. And so there is the intentional story within the book, but then there's also the story that the book tells you. And I think it's part of that idea, particularly in, in the uh, preservation and conservation of books, that we're trying to maintain as much as we can the book as an artifact of history or as almost a talisman of somebody's life. It is gratifying for me to be able to see generations of bookbinders continuing on learning a skill which has been around in our current form of the codex for over a thousand years. The book is having something of a comeback right now. Information when it goes into a book is usually intentional. It's written down for use. Where in our modern world information is kind of recorded haphazardly or accidentally. What people really want is something of more of a permanence. They want to have something they can hold on to, something they can touch, something which is grounded. 
And I think that's one of the things that a physical book brings that, frankly, I don't think a digital book does. You know, when I look at something that was bound up in the 1700s or something like that, and I'm thinking, gosh, you know, how many people have read this? How many hands have, has this passed through? And yet it's still viable, it's still good, and, you know, I'm sitting here able to read it. I think there will always be people that treasure that.